Good morning and welcome to another episode of Money Matters with me, your host, uh, Nev, where we broadcast live every morning at 7 a.m. on onedealaway.com slash live. And it is Friday. It is June 5. I have to double check. I, I don't keep the dates and stuff, y'all. So I am excited for some of the things that we are going to cover today. And uh, really stay tuned if you would like to find out of what's going on uh, with a, a um, stimulus that is coming out of Germany. We're going to be covering of sort of what is the bond market telling us about what we could expect to be coming. And uh, we're going to be exploring what's happening with the interest rates and uh, uh, different investments and different things that you may want to know. So if you are thinking about, hmm, I don't know where the economy is going to go and you want to get informed about what's going on around the world, how to think about your money investment, well, it is the show for you and we'll be back in just 30 seconds. And here we go. Let's get started with what's going on in Germany. You know, Europe has been, well, the entire world actually has been quite severely hit with the coronavirus and then the uh, um, economic kerfuffle, uh, kerfuffle, whatever the word is. Um, but, you know, the, the economic uh, challenges and stuff were existing there. Now it's just more prevalent. We just get to see them a bit more. And as you can see, Germany is sealing a $146 billion stimulus deal. And here we go. In case you're wondering where the folks are looking to invest and what you may be going on and what may be happening, you are going to be able to learn very quickly that we are talking about 5G and uh, uh, railways and incentives for buyers of electric cars. So, uh, you know, I think that the uh, love it, hate it, 5G is coming. And, uh, uh, you know, people I know have been in some of the, the countries and some of the, the cities have been actually tearing down and burning those towers and getting rid of them. And, um, you know, I, I personally think that it is a very scary thing because it's untested. Um, you know, and I don't have an issue with technology. Um, I'm not a technophobe. Uh, I struggle with learning how to use it. I'll admit to that. But I welcome technology. I think it's the greatest thing ever and it could really help solve some of the major issues, which is the reason why I'm so bullish on the blockchain and the cryptocurrency markets, uh, because there's there's a huge problems that we have when it comes to doing business or how we operate or how we used to operate, uh, you know, how we lend, how we borrow, how we trade, how we think about financial system as a whole. So that's the reason why I'm very bullish on it. But, uh, you know, the 5G, uh, the reason that it scares me, I'll be honest with you, is uh, because of the waves that it uses, right? So um, everything is energy and all of the energy uses waves at different uh, uh, levels and different strengths and different wavelengths and all of those different things. And the part that is really weird is that it hasn't been tested to sort of see of what do these new waves and how do they impact humans and life, right? Like I'm talking plants and birds and animals and us and, you know, is it going to impact us and, and how? You know, people are saying that it has a potential to impact us on a cellular level, um, you know, so if, if that's the case and it can change uh, our DNA over time, well, I don't know that I want it. You know, I mean, I technology has been a bit of a challenge and so, um, you know, I don't know where you are and how you feel and what you have been experiencing. But I can tell you that, uh, you know, since the lockdown in March, it was fine. In April, it started to kind of happen. And I've seen it definitely pick up in month of May where the Internet, right? I, same computer, same network, same utilization, same everything. But I am experiencing, you know, dropped calls, uh, both phone and Internet, super slow Internet, intermittent connections. When I'm out with my phone and, you know, sometimes I'll actually uh, watch i don't watch the youtube but like i listen and i'll have headphones and as i'm walking you know and i live in a city y'all i live in a city so it's not like a rural when i go rural and i sort of drop the calls and stuff like i get it because i'm rural but i am in a city and uh, uh i literally just 
there's no there's no internet no uh, data no cell service no nothing like it literally just drops it uh, in uh, uh, in a very prominent area of the town and it's really bizarre and it happens downtown as well it, it's never happened before and so uh, my conspiracy theory says that the companies are doing this to get us to want and desire 5g uh, but you know i could very much be wrong and so this is not confirmed again this is just my sort of conspiracy theory so i i do have some concerns about it now when it comes to uh the whole like railways and stuff i think I think that that's something that uh, you know countries and governments will do to sort of uh, uh, implement these high-speed trains and you know. But but I uh, I worry a little bit about the railways uh, components because it's similar to the airlines and I think people are still very afraid to be in large groups and to sit for extended period of time in a confined area with total strangers and you know we have this very much distrust now with people of are they sick are they not sick am i gonna get sick am i gonna pass something on to them you know and you put on those masks and stuff but they're not 100 percent proof and you know now you see the people that have like a mask right here right and like the nose is completely covered and stuff or they'll just wear it on a chin and i'm like well you might as well remove it like it's <laughs> so it's becoming more of a fashion statement than it is uh, uh, what it was meant, I think, uh, to be. But, you know, that's the new normal. So, uh, but I do think, you know, especially here in the United States, uh, I think we're lagging behind the world in some of these structural components. I mean, our our, um, our airports are, aside from a handful that have been improved, are, uh, I mean, you feel like you're entering fourth world country not even third world country because i think third world countries or developing countries have a much better airport than we do um and matter of fact actually i know they do because i visited them and you land in some of these countries and the airport is like really nice and you go in and they have these like you know brand new bridges and all these different things and then you come to the united states and the airport is like falling apart um it's cold it's ugly there's nothing happening there um, it's it's not very welcoming and then you leave it and you go and start driving around and of course I haven't driven the entire United States uh, nor do I plan doing it anytime soon but here in, in New England where I live um, you know you go through and we have a we have this bridge right like the, the overpass so you have a street and you have an overpass which is actually a freeway and it's being held by freaking lumber by lumber like it's literally it's falling apart you can see the wires and stuff and it doesn't make you feel very safe going underneath it or driving on top of it um uh, you know and so and uh, don't even get me started on the lack of public transportation that if you don't have a car like good luck getting anywhere and the limited public transportation that exists it it travels very intermittently um it doesn't go where you want to go so um, I think U.S. has a, a lot of room for improvement, and in my personal opinion, and we're going to talk about unemployment, but in my personal opinion, you know, if we want to get the restart to this economy, stop printing money and let's get these projects on the way. Let's start building things. Let's start creating stuff. Let's, you know, let's open and create some of the factories here in the United States and teach folks, uh, uh, you know, uh, important skills to kind of benefit the economy and really open uh, uh, ability to improve these airports let's get into the railways let's build the the fast sort of those bullet trains that exist everywhere else in the world except for here in the united states and i just don't understand why and then of course the incentives for buyers of electric cars um you know um uh, i think folks are trying to move away from fossil fuels although although if you've been watching i think it's called the planet of the humans uh, michael moore film um, it's uh, recently been banned actually from youtube i don't know if it's back it might be uh, but uh, uh maybe you've seen it maybe you haven't where you know a lot of these electric and green it's still folk it's still using fossil fuels just sort of in the background it's just not as obvious to you um, but i think that these incentives for buyers of cars and that kind of stuff I think that that's going to to keep happening because they they want to uh, you know stimulate the economy and unfortunately or fortunately depending how you look at it our economy is consumer driven so in order for the economy in order for the countries to actually benefit is that you have to uh, uh, 
you know, go out and buy stuff and the business has to get things. And, you know, my, my fear of, uh, and we'll discuss some of the other stuff uh, in the in this episode today, but my fear and, and, and sort of the way that I see it is that, uh, you know, I, I don't know that people are going to be buying stuff and the stocks are priced for that stuff. You know, for a while I've been wondering, like, why are the stocks so decoupled from the rest of the economy? You know, we have highest unemployment ever. Uh, people say since uh, uh, Great Depression, but I think we are there. I think we're at the Great Depression level. Uh, we have uh, rioting and protests. We have shut down economies. We have businesses that were shut down for three months and now they're trying to reopen, but they got destroyed. So they're not coming back. Those jobs are not coming back. Um, and, uh, you know, and I don't see... Uh, there's no like pent up demand. I know people are talking about that, but like I need a haircut, right? But I'm not going to go. I'm, I'm going to go and get a haircut, but I'm not going to go in a course of a week and get like three haircuts to make up for the time that I didn't get it. Right. Like I don't need three. I just need one. Same thing with like food stuff. Um, you know, I know restaurants are opening up and they're opening at like slower capacity and stuff. And I see people kind of going in and picking up. But most of it's still you know, where I am right now is still to go. And, uh, you know, most people, if they sit down, like you don't want to sit down in a restaurant with the mask. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, but once you do that a couple of times, you're like, all right, like um, it's not. I, I don't know. I, I think I think how we operate and how we do stuff and how we do business and how we spend and earn money and all of that stuff is going to change in a, in a massive, massive way. So anyways, um, Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, coalition agreed to sweep in 130 billion euro of 146, the uh, 46 billion dollars stimulus package designed to spur short term consumer spending and get business business says investing again. So it's it's one of those things that uh, you know I think we're going to see it again. They're allocating uh, you know money to 5G data, improved railways, and the electric vehicles. And so uh, because their auto industry has fallen down, and I think in U.S. as well, we just haven't seen the reports quite yet. Um, so I I do expect to see some of the stuff here. Uh, we've already seen some of the stimulus. So where I see this basically going is that um, it's very much, uh, uh, you know, I think we're going to experience some of the uh, boost and stuff for the cars and different things uh, around uh, United States and around the world. And, uh, you know, we've already passed some bills uh, when it comes to improving for the 5G technology. Uh, I think there's some conversations about improving bills for the blockchain technology. Um, and I really do see that kind of taken off. And I know that some of the fox, uh, folks are looking at uh, some of the, the, the uh, companies that have or are working on 5G um, and starting to invest heavily in that market. Um, again, I, I don't know how I feel about it. So obviously to each their own, as they say. Um, but because I don't feel comfortable with 5G, um, I don't know that I necessarily want to invest in something that I don't believe in, uh, even if it means that I potentially lose some gains. All right, so let's switch a little bit now and let's take a look at what's going on in the gold, silver, um, and kind of what's been happening with this stuff. So um, uh, we've been covering this stuff. I'm going to be monitoring these things. But as you can see, the 24-hour uh, gold spot price is... Uh, you know, it's sort of dropped down a little bit and it's been mostly flat. Uh, last time we did this, we were at about 1750. We're about 1700 for uh, for gold and uh, $17 uh, for silver. As you can see, it's been trading mostly sideways, um, especially if we look at it in 24 hours. And uh, we are seeing that the gold silver ratio has actually dropped. We were at 120 uh, a couple of months ago, then it was like 100 teens, it was 100. So now you can see that it's between, uh, that it's actually at 96.8. Now I wanna see if we could actually get a bit better um, silver spot price. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, so we lost power, we lost internet, but I am still going. We're gonna record this and uh, I'm gonna be showing you what I've been able to find, uh, but I won't be able to search anything right now. So. Right now, unfortunately, the stream has died. I'm running off of uh, 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 battery power. Uh, so, of course, when you lose power, you lose uh, Internet. And uh, I'm not quite sure why we lost power. It's not a big storm. I'm actually looking out the window. Um, but um, I guess one way to find out. So we'll find out eventually. 
of what's been going on and hopefully they'll be able to re uh, restore it rather quickly but that was really bizarre that it just sort of went out uh, so India is unveiling ambitious plan to become a global tech manufacturing hub and uh, we've already talked about the fact that India is looking to uh, basically become uh, the new China you know in the the sort of this whole war between the United States and China Western Europe and China over the virus over the trade over the you know who's manipulating currency who's not I think everybody is if you ask me personally um, and you know now with the Hong Kong and all the other stuff uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, Western countries saying ah we don't know how we feel about China so India is strategically step stepping up and saying hey remember us like we're ready to go and India actually potentially could be one of the you know one of the the best uh, uh, places that is sort of next on the rise you know I really could see India uh, picking up they do have a good demographic uh, they are very large uh, large population they are hard-working uh, they speak English most of them um, and uh, um, you know so I do see India over the next uh, decade maybe two decades really picking up um, of course I have high expectation for Africa as well uh, but just uh, uh, so I could see India becoming sort of the new global tech hub and not just services but and support uh, but also doing the tech and everything else um, so you know what I mean like so so that could be very very interesting um, and uh, um, I am being notified that uh, internet is back on we're back on to the streaming and so uh, you know let's continue let's continue uh, exploring of what's going on and sorry for those of you watching live my sincere apologies for the power loss and the internet loss because it kind of goes together um, I don't control any of that stuff so my apologies nonetheless so we've just talked about this we just talked about the fact that um, the US unemployment rate they're saying could reach 20 percent with nearly 43 million Americans out of work I am saying we are at about 20 percent I think it could reach well above 20 percent now what we're seeing right now is that we've uh, this past week um, we were reported 1.87 million um, uh, individuals have lost their jobs um, or have been furloughed as well um, and so it's slightly less than 2.2 that happened a week prior so the nice part is that we're sort of tapering off um, the other piece that is kind of nice is that we're also seeing some of the folks who have been unemployed are actually starting to get their jobs back as companies businesses government cities states and stuff start opening up so that's the nice part of the whole thing um, however I am a bit worried that um, you know again um, we might see sort of this big like open like Woo -hoo, this is exciting and then sort of like eh, uh, not much happening uh, it's sort of like um, if you you know if you if you have a dog uh, and they go outside right like they're so excited and they like book it outside and they're running around like crazy for a few minutes and and then they just chillax right like they, they end up sitting down and going patiently for a walk or whatever like it's not as big of a deal and I kind of see that uh, happening a little bit with um, with what's going on in the economy right now so um, uh, so that's kind of what I see happening all right so now let's take a look at the silver um, we've we've already talked about the fact that gold is sort of starting to kind of uh, slow down and potentially go down uh, there are many individuals and, and folks that expect that gold is going to draw do, go down in price at least short term I am one of those um, I won't lie I'll be very honest um, I also expect Bitcoin to go down short term in price and I look forward to both because that means I get to acquire more of them uh, for cheaper price so I'm kind of excited about that um, long term I see both of them uh, going up but that's just that's that's not uh, financial advice that's just Nev's opinion okay so I just want to be straight on uh, what this is and what it's not so that we're not confused uh, but you know Peter Schiff is basically saying silver on the way to hit record high um, and uh, you know he's expecting the commodity bull market coming and you know what I think I think he might be right um, we are seeing that gold silver ratio to sort of close the gap 
uh, which is normal, right? You have this very, very big uh, uh, separation between the two. And then it starts slowly to kind of go in as you see gold sort of drop and you see silver start to rise. Um, I don't know that they will ever meet in price. Uh, although, you know what? Anything is possible these days. So never say never. Um, and that would definitely be an interesting day if gold and silver ever came to the same price. I've never actually analyzed that. I've never thought about it. It just hit me right now as we're talking. Uh, but that would definitely be something that is interesting for sure. Uh, so I don't know. We'll, we'll see, you know, what, what happens. But uh, Peter Schiff is basically saying, you know, I am expecting this puppy to go up to the roof. Um, and so he is, uh, he was, I believe, on Boon Bust on RT and talking about, you know, uh, he's very, very excited about, uh, you know, uh, you know, gold may not be kind of happening and stuff, but, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely bullish on silver and, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, um, the allergy season is definitely here. I can, I can like smell it or actually I can't smell anything. I can feel it because I can't smell anything. Uh, but, you know, um, silver has been having a very suppressed price, and so it does have a good potential to actually go uh, quite a bit higher up. So I think that it's going to be a very, very interesting piece um, and something we should all be watching. I am very bullish on uh, silver, um, gold as well. Uh, again, short term, I do expect gold to go down. Um, I don't know about silver. I kind of expect it to go a little bit sideways, maybe slightly up. Um, but I do expect both of them to go up uh, long term. All right. So now we're going to switch and, you know, move into some more of the uh, academic or uh, academic macro views of the world and sort of what's what's happening and what's going on. So uh, this is going to be coming out of Market Watch, and then we're going to uh, look at some of the bond markets and sort of what's what's happening uh, with these things. But uh, before we do, you know, I'm very, really interested to uh, hear from folks as soon as we're done with the recording of what uh, what they expect is going to uh, is going to happen when it comes to uh, gold, silver, Bitcoin. Like, where do you sit? And I'm, I'm sure that I've upset some folks by saying that they're going to go down in short term. But that's just that's just my opinion, my analysis, my sort of view. Uh, I, I expect all of them to go up long term and I believe in them as a very good long term investment. Um, I just think in a short term uh, we might see it go lower, which again, good buying opportunity. All right. So get ready for the Fed to deploy untested monetary policy uh, plan in September. So what exactly is going on? So U.S. yield curve control is likely to be paired with forward guidance. And uh, I couldn't highlight this one for whatever reason. It wasn't highlighting. So we'll go through it uh, together if that's okay with you uh, because I think this is an important piece because if they're going to start doing something in fall, I think it's important for us to understand that today so that we can prepare for it and have plenty of time to sort of uh, get ready for the changes coming. You know, you don't want to react when things are happening. You want to know what is happening when it's happening so that uh, you have plenty of time to react prior to it and then you can just minor adjustment as we go through it. So what they're saying is basically get ready for the Federal Reserve to target bond yields as one of the many unprecedented measures the central bank has undertaken to support the economy. The Fed may shift to a policy of buying bonds to cap yields for short dated maturities at fixed levels. So this is coming out of B of A uh, Global Research. B of A Global Research has been uh, stepping up and doing a lot of reporting. I don't know if you have noticed that or not, but um, it's almost like they are turning from a bank into like a financial analysis and research firm. Um, which, hey, I am all for folks having multiple streams of income and preparing. And, uh, but it also signals something very interesting to me where I'm thinking maybe my argument that, uh, um, you know, banks as we know them are going away thanks to digital cash. Uh, so I think that they are doing the right thing. They're shifting slowly into what is coming. And I think that that's a lesson that all of us can learn personal in business and everything else. So... Uh, but they're saying that uh, they're looking to this to happen likely in September as the Fed looks to mitigate the risk of deflation over the next few years. 
The new policy may result from worries that the Fed currently lacks tools to support economic growth when policy interest rates are near zero, right? So they don't have much of a movement anyways. And so they can't, what, what do you do? You turn it negative, uh, which they might, and we're gonna cover that as well, uh, but it doesn't work. It's been proven it doesn't work. We covered it on this channel that it doesn't work. So it's, it's, a, it's a futile effort in doing it. It's sort of like, a, you know, you're on Titanic and it's shipping and the water is gushing in and you're taking a thimble and you're like, I'm helping. It's, it's not doing anything. It's not doing anything other than keeping you busy and getting you exhausted. Um, in an interview with Market Watch, the former New York Fed uh, staffer now at B of A noted this so-called policy of yield curve control hasn't been seen much use by other monetary policy makers. Only Australia and Japan have adopted the unconventional policy measure so far. So once it was viewed as outlandish option, uh, but you know, the, uh, by used by deflation strike in Japan, yield, con con yield curve control, say that fi fast five times, has come up in recent discussions among senior Fed officials. So they are basically talking about, you know, are we going to control this by jumping in and out, buying as we need to? So it's going to be interesting. And if you are like wanting to learn a bit more about what's been going on with the Japan, uh, you definitely want to look for, uh, I believe it's called the Princess of Yen. Let's take a look together. The Princess. Hold on. All right. Let's, 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 let's look at this. Let's look at this. Princess of Yen. It's a, it's a YouTube video piece so uh, you can take a look it's a it's a documentary based off of uh the the book by the same by the same uh, uh, name and so i think it's a good place where you can go and start learning about what they have done in order to understand what uh, what we might be doing here in the united states or the rest of the world because you know when uh, uh, interesting piece is that when us does something oftentimes the world follows or when um, austria does something uh, you know the rest of the world may implement it so it's important to kind of learn of what's been going on so they're basically saying that the yield curve control is likely to come in conjunction with forward guidance that interest rates will be kept low until certain inflation targets are hit to prevent investors from thinking that the Fed will tighten monetary policy um, and you know sort of start pulling money away so uh, from their perspective uh, you know, we're not going to go forward with the guidance because we don't believe that we're going to hit 2% for a long time, uh, but even want to reinforce the fact that we'll be quite accommodative after that. Uh, so they're basically saying, we don't want anybody to get spooked ever. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to control and manipulate the market. When I say it's been manipulated and people say, no, it's not. It is manipulated, y'all. It's manipulated uh, in, in inside the companies, outside the companies, the new accounting uh, practices, the, uh, the stock buybacks, the Fed printing. And when they print, they basically give it to the friends that are closest to them, who then give it to the friends who are closest to them. And this is why you have the, uh, the elite or 1% or whoever want to call them that are making money hand over fist and really benefiting the rest of the world is basically... Uh, uh, drowning, drowning in debt that they cannot surface, drowning in, in the fact that they're not making money, uh, drowning in the fact that they uh, don't have any meaningful work or any work whatsoever. Um, and so it's, it's a huge problem. And again, we'll, we'll cover that stuff in the upcoming um, articles. But I want to take a look at now the bond market. And the bond market is flashing stagflation. And this is one of those things that is interesting. Because if we were to look at, let me really quickly... Uh, take a look at this uh, 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 Dow price, right? Um, if we were to look at uh, the Dow, uh, let me see if I can bring you in. Um, uh, you know, let's let's take a look at this stuff, right? I mean, yeah, it's down over the stuff, but you know, it's it's been, it's been up. And if you were to look at the market over the last month, you're thinking everything is freaking hunky-dory, but it's not, it's not. You know, people are unemployed. We've, we've just covered that uh, over 20% uh, of people are unemployed. Um, you know, people are protesting. Uh, you know, uh, uh, there's uh, what? Um, somebody has mentioned that, like, I don't even want to know, like, how many tens of millions of people um, go hungry every single day or depend on 
uh, the sort of the food bank and that kind of stuff in order to be able to to eat for the day. Um, so, you know, we're experiencing some major, major, major problems and you look at a market and it's like, no, everything is great. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's perfect. It's not perfect. It's a fake market. I've already called it. I've been talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. But let's take a look at what they're saying because the bond market is flashing something very, very different. Okay. So they're saying the bond market sounded the alarm that the flood of cash the policymakers have unleashed to uh, buy you the growth in the face of pandemic will have potential painful consequences for the economy. The uh, yield curve is the steepest in three years, with long maturity rates climbing as the Federal Reserve prints billions of dollars a week to add to its stockpile of government debt and other assets. The steepening phenomena is typical a signal of improving growth prospects. The riskier assets such as uh, stocks are certainly uh, rallying. Um, the risk that the market is starting to grapple with is that the pandemic's wakes deflation, a troublesome combination of tepid growth and accelerating inflation. Cash is flooding into the funds that invest in inflation protected securities and break even rates. Another uh, gauge or gauge, gauge, I don't know how you say it, of consumer price expectations are ticking back higher. So uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, they're saying that, you know, the, the growth is not going to be happening, which I agree. Um, when they're talking about the accelerating inflation, I don't necessarily see it in everything. I see this sort of weirdly weird deflation in some areas, super ridiculous inflation in other areas. Like things that matter, I think, are going to go up in a price. Um, you know, like food, for example, um, is going to go in a price. Like I do expect that piece. But like some of the other stuff may not. You know, like ability to buy a business is going to be lower than ever. You know, uh, 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 I, I do think that the stocks are probably going to go higher because it, as much as it doesn't make sense that I do think it's going to crash at some point um, and I've been expecting it. But, you know, I've, I've been wrong. I, I thought it was going to happen um, much faster and it's not. And it seems to me that, you know, if all of this money that is being printed is being pushed into the market, well, then market is going to do the same thing that it did in 08, 09 when I expected the stock market to uh, to do something unprecedented and uh, um, you know back then you know we saw this thing called wedge where um, you know the top part of it was going this way I can't do it and so you would see this way right so this is what we would see it was it's not wedge sorry megaphone megaphone uh, piece where you know the highers um, the higher getting higher and the lows are getting lower and it's like you didn't know where it was going to go. And we're seeing that happening right now as well. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it went higher. I, I didn't think it was possible, but it did. And it's been rallying ever since. And then we hit this thing. And again, I, I you know, I don't see how it makes sense that you are buying a stock that has a, a P ratio of like 1,500. 1,500, but people are jumping in it. I, so... You know, I guess fundamentally, when you look at it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but if the money is going into it, then, yeah, we could definitely see inflation in, in the stock market. Um, and that wouldn't surprise me uh, one bit. It doesn't feel right. It feels really awkward and wrong. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's a reality. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis will be remembered for many things. And among them will be the long-awaited return of inflation in developed markets. Um, and this is coming from uh, Oliver Harvey, a macro strategist at Deutsche Bank. Um, in a world of zero rates, inflation may seem like a distant threat. The Fed's balance sheet alone has swelled above seven trillion from about four trillion in early March, and more steps uh, may be coming, such as yield curve control, which we just talked about, right? Uh, the uh, corporation's reliance on Fed support means that the central bank will have to continue providing liquidity to the system until inflation rates pick up to levels that probably would be viewed as unacceptable by mo per most participants in the Fed today. Um, and they're kind of talking about the stagflation that, uh, you know, they're basically saying that um, equities, uh, you know, uh, remain on the front foot initially as the economy reflates. Uh, then heading lower, bond prices falling, commodities rising, and dollar weakness. Uh, weakness. Um, I don't. I don't know that I agree with with this stuff over here. Um, 
I could see if 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 the bond deal goes up, then yeah, bond prices will fall. Um, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the commodities do rise because they have been really low. But um, again, we'll see. Um, I do expect the dollar actually to strengthen um, in the near term, not uh, get lower. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, and, and the stocks are showing us that clearly uh, they can survive just about anything. And Fed will ensure that that actually ends up happening. So now we get to see what's happening uh, around the world. So there's a report out of the Gold Telegraph that is basically saying many countries are beginning to drift towards negative rates. And, uh, you know, uh, in the past, of course, when you said negative rates, uh, nobody would ever consider that. And that was sort of a, a, a bad word in the world of, of economy and finance. Um, but, you know, now now it's it's a new normal and now everything we're considering everything. Right. Including controlling the yield curve. What? OK. You know, buying junk bonds like I, don't even get me started. Um, so traditionally, when there is a positive rate, many financial institutions stored their excess cash at a central bank for safekeeping. Typically, those institutions earn a small return on those funds, but in a negative rate environment, the bank gets charged by the central bank for storing dollars. So they're trying to penalize the banks for hanging on to the cash instead of lending it out. And so they want people and businesses to borrow more at ultra low rates, which should then, in theory, help with economic growth. And the first country to implement negative interest rates was Sweden followed by European Central Bank. And then we've seen it in Denmark, Switzerland, Japan, and uh, so on. So we've seen it all over the place. Um, and they're basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, going through and saying, you know, we are seeing this happening everywhere, but we already covered this stuff that, you know, uh, it may not necessarily be uh, the best way to do this stuff because not many people um, are going to want to uh, borrow money when it comes to this stuff and they may indeed decide that you know what um, we're not interested in in doing this uh, we want to actually you know forget it man we're not doing it we're not borrowing more we're actually saving more uh, creating a deflationary environment even more deflationary um, so uh, but now we're going to finish with this very very interesting article uh, that kind of makes you go, hmm. So the Norman Trader. And uh, um, so this was by uh, Sven Henrik, um, written on June 3rd. So a couple of years ago, my apologies, but, you know, we can't cover everything all the time. So here it is. It's sort of his uh, uh, um, take on what's going on. And, you know, I, it's very interesting, and I think we need to cover it. Um, I, for one, am surprised how effective central banks have been in squeezing markets higher again. I thought after 10 years of this monetary nonsense, they would finally lose effectiveness in their ability to manipulate markets. Clearly, I was wrong. I was wrong too, Sven. I was wrong too. I think a bunch of us were wrong in that. But then again, I also didn't see $3 trillion in Fed balance sheet expansion coming in a matter of few months. I didn't either until Corona uh, sort of hit, and then I did. I knew that they would come in super fast, but it also it's not enough, and the more is going to be needed. But I don't know that they're going to be as fast to react as I've been mentioning, or that they will react much at all. It might be short term, one sort of burst, but then they're going to go away, and that's when real pain is coming in, and that's what I'm afraid of. You know, they're going to do just about anything in the United States now until the election. So between now and like towards what, November, uh, December of this year, um, you know, hey, I good times are coming. Um, we, you know, yes, it's going to get very political and stuff, but uh, financially speaking, good times are coming. It's after that that I'm worried about. So that's what, 2021? So may we live in interesting times, my friends. In their quest to conduct a successful resource operation, they're killing a patient in the process. ECB will announce more stimulus, which they did, uh, but bottom line, distortions have become more extreme than expected. Valuations are screaming danger. And uh, I don't know if we could see this. Uh, let me see if we could actually zoom in because yes, let's take a look at this stuff. 
So this is the Buffett indicator variant of Wilshire 5000 to GDP. So he has this um, indicator. Take a look at it while I sip some water, please. So the Wilshire 5000 basically takes just about the entire stock market and it basically, uh, uh, you know, takes over the, the nominal quarterly GDP and creates this indicator to see, you know, where's the stock market in comparison to the GDP. And uh, Buffett, uh, allegedly, I, I don't know the guy, so I can't speak. He definitely does this. Um, but allegedly, he uses this to evaluate where we are with the stock market. And does it make sense to invest? You know, should you buy? Should you sell? Should you just sit on the sideline and wait to see what happens? And so you will see that, you know, it goes back from the 70s on. And you can see that it was like, you know, in 80s. And then it was, you know, I would say that this was super good time to buy, right? 70s and 80s. So if that's the inflation that they are talking about of the 70s where, you know, everything ends up being cheaper, we might hit these levels and that's going to be an amazing time to buy, y'all. Amazing time to buy. Um, but if you have cash, right? Like you, you have to have money. You have to get ready for it. Um, and then we've seen sort of the ridiculousness of the 2000. And this was the dot-com crash. Then we dropped down. Uh, then we sort of picked up, uh, then this was the 2008 uh, uh, financial fiasco. Then we dropped down to the, you know, the 2009 level where I was talking about that megaphone pattern where you don't understand what's going on. And we've been climbing steadily up since then. But now we are at the highest level ever uh, and we're seeing a megaphone pattern. And so this is the part where I'm sitting and saying, I, I don't know. I don't know how to play this. Uh, uh, again, I think they're going to goose it up, uh, at least short term, uh, but we'll see. And so it's interesting. Now, he takes actually another piece, and it's corporate um, equities to GDP. And uh, uh, so it's, it's basically a ratio. So it talks about corporate equities, liability from the Federal Reserve quarterly uh, balance sheet. Uh, this series is also published in the Fred repository, as, and so it gives you exactly where you can find stuff plus nominal uh, quarterly GDP. Well, it's not plus, it's divided. Um, so you can, again, see from the 50s, you know, back into the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. Again, you can see that it follows very closely, right? 81, 34, 87, 32. Um, then we were at, uh, what is this? This is 2000, right? You were at 134. Uh, you're at 159, uh, sorry. Uh, so you see that it follows very, very closely. Now, the corporate equities to GDP um, is slightly lower than the previous high, but the Wilshire 5000 to GDP is higher than, uh, slightly higher than we were in the 2000. Yesterday, we closed at 145.6 market cap to GDP. Today, markets are trading at 146%. These are not only historical extreme valuations, they're also entirely incompatible with any valuation history in context of the economic backdrop we have. 20% unemployment, massive aggressive earnings, you name it. Some will justify the highest valuation with coming V-shaped economy, but there is no V. Okay, Projections yesterday suggest it may take a decade to recover from all this, and it shows the real GDP current forecast. So you see... It's basically a square root that somebody actually ended up calling. And uh, kudos to Rao Paul yet again being right. This The man is a genius. Um, if you are not uh, listening him, uh, following him, uh, listening to what he has to say, reading what he writes, um, you absolutely have to. So Rao Paul of Real Vision, uh, the guy knows what he's talking about. And, and uh, um, I am mesmerized, absolutely mesmerized with him, um, you know, at, at, Everything he publishes, I absolutely take a look at and, and watch and read and study because it's it's been very, very helpful and it helps given a, a, a perspective that sometimes we don't always see. Anyways, the only V is in the stock market driven by artificial liquidity and it's dividing the haves and have-nots even further apart. This brings us to in, uh, wealth inequality, which I've talked about and it sounds like the Sven, the gentleman writing this, has talked about as well. 2020 has seen the largest expansion in wealth inequity, inequality yet. Jet Powell, or sorry, Jay Powell, 
may deny all he wants that the Fed's policies are contributing to wealth inequality, but that is just a lie. So I don't know if you know, but Jay Powell came and said, you know, what we're doing over here has nothing to do with inequality when it comes to the to the income. Well, I agree. It may not have anything to do with income, uh, sort of, maybe, uh, but it does have to do a lot with the wealth uh, because, you know, the, the, the top 1% uh, get their wealth from the holding on the equities. The bottom get there from the job. And so, you know, uh, uh, earnings wise, you know, we may all be earning, quote unquote, close to the same. But wealth is being held by 1%, as he talks about, uh, in the stocks by 1% in the equities, whereas the bottom 50% own virtually no stocks. The bottom, which is predominantly lost their jobs, thanks to the Fed, um, monstrous intervention to keep the top 1% and uh, keep their assets intact. Mohammed El Aryan uh, wrote, by contributing to higher wealth inequality and dragging the Fed deeper into quasi-fiscal funding operations, the central bank also risks its credibility and political uh, uh, autonomy. So the jury's out, but I, for one, would not be surprised to see Fed eventually implement negative interest rates. I agree. I actually talked about that as well, especially if markets were to drop hard again and the whole, like, you can't control the yield curve uh, doesn't pan out. As it stands, we're staring at the biggest and fastest stock market recovery in history, because uh, especially considering the economic evaluation backdrop. So you can see that it just went whoop. Um, but we'll see. You know, is it going to continue? Is it going to go down? Or is it going to basically be uh, this? Nobody knows this. Nobody knows this uh, whatsoever. Uh, but I think it's important to understand. And please do understand, this is Nasdaq. So. Uh, which is predominantly technology stuff. This is the megaphone pattern that I was just talking about. Here we go. We can observe that the infamous, infamous megaphone pattern has once again been reached. And you can see it right here. And this is the scary part because you don't know what is going to happen. You know, is it going to go down and back up? Is it going to trade within this channel going further up and further down as it progresses? Or is it going to break to one end? And we don't really know that. But the squeeze may not be over yet. As we can note on the futures contract, the trend line is a bit higher still. So you can see the trend line kind of happening. And, uh, you know, there's still a uh, room to kind of uh, grow and, and it's, it's moving up. My view here, this is not sustainable. It has no funda foundation in earnings, growth or future expected growth. It is Fed manufactured. And yes, I believe what I say. The Fed has vastly disconnected asset prices from the economy and only multiple expansions can keep investors on the safe side. To me, this action is not sustainable. The disconnect and distortion too large, setting markets up for nasty reversion to come. And the reversion itself uh, will then cause a massive dampening in sentiment. In short, they have set markets and the economy up for deepening of the malaise as the liquidity is going to all the wrong places but the real economy. And um, this is, you know, I agree with this stuff. And this is the part that I was I was talking about and discussing um, in the channel over here and, and sharing in this episode as well to say, you know, it's it makes sense to go and put money in. If you're going to put money into something, put it into building of our uh, restructuring our, uh, well, finances as well. But, you know, the the sort of the, the the airports and the roads and the 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 trains and let's rebuild this country let's put money into the good use but no it's being put into this synthetic stuff that has no meaning whatsoever that is completely decoupled from reality and if this was a human if this stock market was a human we would call them delusional uh right like Cognitive ability gone. We probably would put a uh, put the individual into some sort of uh, um, institution um, or potentially the the long term care uh, facility so that somebody can watch over them because they are completely disconnected from the reality. And yet, this is where we find ourselves. So there we go. Sorry again about the power loss, the uh, the sort of intermittent streaming piece. Uh, but hopefully you have enjoyed the show. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay forever money blessed. Join me tomorrow at 7 a.m. And until then, 
Just remember, you are only one deal away.